Welcome to Interparty Conflict, the podcast where we answer your questions so you can have the best tabletop gaming experience possible. My name is Gabe. And my name is Jeff. And we're going to answer your questions today. But first, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Jeff, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Went to uh, I went to a petting farm today. Oh, I saw some pictures on Facebook. Yeah, how yeah. was that? That's fun. It's just um, it's there. There's like a petting farm not too far from here, mm -hmm. uh, close to where uh, Skylar works. And so, oh wait, wait, that's uh, that's not a petting farm. That's just somebody's house. Oh, oh Jeff. god, <laughs> those are you their actually, kids. You, those are their kids. Exactly. <laughs> <We're> just, <laughs> they got some. Well, anyway, <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it, there's just like a little petting farm that we pass by on the road all the time. Mm -hmm. So like we went there once last year and, you know, it's it's a small little thing and it's it's really not much, but we like animals and, yeah. you know, it's just so we just go there and we just it was a nice day. So we went out and yeah, pet the, some cows. The weather is starting to finally get nice now that it is, uh, you know, well into April. Right. Yeah. Finally starting to get nice. So um, I was. If it was, it, it was sort of looking like it was going to rain for a bit, and I guess it did rain for a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Um, if I, if it weren't for that, and if it weren't for the fact that I had to get my taxes done mm. today, mm. Uh, I we probably would have tried to go out to a park or something. Yeah. But uh, I had to get my taxes done because taxes are due in about a week or so. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'm, luck, lucky, lucky for me, my my mother is a is a like a human calculator and set. like <laughs> she 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 really enjoys well I, she says she does but yeah she she offers to do it for me every mm. year so i'm just like okay thank you like that that is a load off my mind so yeah i want to say uh lisa's mom did it for us one or two years when we first started when we first got married but uh she doesn't do it completely but she definitely helps me with it so like i, right. I took all of our Stuff over there. She she knows what to look for and like going down the list. And yeah. she knows to be like, oh, maybe you qualify for this credit and so on and sure. so on. Um, so, yeah, taxes. Isn't that exciting Woo! to hear about on yeah. our on our podcast? <laughs> let's see. Yeah, let's talk about that for a while. Yeah. But it uh, so it does look like we're going to owe a couple hundred dollars. But, yeah. you know, could be worse. Uh, anyway, so you want to uh, go ahead and jump in this episode? Sure. I guess. OK, Jeff, I want you to imagine that. You are in on a battlefield. Okay. There's a war going on. Mm -hmm. And there's there's enemies on every side. You see there's some goblins. You see there's some kobolds. There's some orcs. Oh, man. There's a troll or two. The Dang. trolls, for some reason, have this, uh, this like, bone in their arm <laughs> and that only mammals have, but or only primates have, specifically. <laughs> but for some reason, the trolls have them, too. Uh, anyway, but you... You're terrified and you're surrounded and you're confused. Give me a perception check. Okay. That's a that's a 17. Okay. Well, so luckily for you, through all of the noise and the confusion of this battle, you hear a voice ringing out, a familiar voice. Okay. It is your general's voice. He's Ooh. shouting out orders. He's giving you instructions. You know what to do. Mm. And so following his instruction, you... You know, you group up with some of your allies, you do whatever you do in an army and <laughs> army uh, stuff and you win, I guess <laughs> I could draw that out, but I'm not going to. And then after the battle is over and everybody's celebrating, you go to give your your general, uh, you give him a handshake, except he's very tall. <laughs> uh, his his scales are uh, sorry. He has scales. Oh, I should mention. Sure. It's a weird skin condition he's got. Yeah. He's got uh, green scales. Okay. Oof. And uh, his breath is real bad. Okay. <laughs> but you you raise a glass, he leans down and clinks his little glass against yours and you cheers or whatever the heck you do. And uh, he starts telling you a story about his home. Mm -hmm. And his home is uh, the Dragon's Horde. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, today's Dragon's Horde item was submitted by Tim via email. Mm -hmm. And this item is the Commander's Horn. This fine horn is granted to one deemed worthy by his peers in order to take charge when the need arises. If the majority of a party agrees, they can designate one member the commander by giving them this horn. The horn gives the user these following abilities. Mm. First, Strategist. 
Once per combat, after initiative order is determined, the commander can cause up to three of his allies to switch positions in the order. Whoa. So, like, you can move around initiative a little bit. Uh, that's cool. That is pretty cool. Uh, give orders. Second one. Once per round, the commander can use a free action to give orders to all party members that they can see. Hmm. So, maybe less... Less mechanical, but still, you know, an important thing. You can yeah. tell someone if you can see an enemy and they can't, you can give order, whatever. Sure. And the last one is advantageous positions. If two or more party members are adjacent to the same enemy, the commander can give advantage to one of the party members on attacks against that enemy. Okay. So they give them like pack tactics, sort of. Pretty much, yeah, because uh, a lot of people might not realize this, but flanking, which was a very big thing in third edition and fourth edition, isn't really a thing in 5th edition. It's yeah. a variant rule. You can add it in, but by default, you don't gain any benefit from being adjacent to an enemy, being on opposite sides of an enemy. One notable exception is that uh, rogues gain the ability to sneak attack, but you don't inherently get advantage when in that <laughs> right. position. Yeah. If you were using this item in a campaign where you are using that house rule, that ability is going to be a lot less useful because it's in yeah. the... I mean, useless, it's but. it's useful because if you're not like if there's no way to get on complete opposite sides mm -hmm, of somebody, mm -hmm. you can still use this and get the advantage. Sure, because sure. like with pack tactics, it, as long as they're adjacent, they don't have to be on exact opposite sides. Yeah. Um. So I like this item. Mm -hmm. I like uh what I don't know. I, I like I like the idea of people sort of taking control and 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 giving out orders and yeah. such. I think we'll probably talk some more about that as the episode goes on. Sure. But uh, I like it. I like it. I like the abilities it gives. I like how the strategist ability, where you can change up the initiative order, that's really cool. That isn't really a thing that happens in yeah in, in fifth edition D anD. I feel like that's actually kind of powerful because the way it's, the way I read it is like if somebody has like a plus five their initiative, and mm -hmm. then somebody only has a plus zero. Yeah. Like if that you know the guy the guy with the plus five gets first in initiative, but the party wants the guy with the low initiative to be first in battle. Sure. Like, are they just completely swapping order? Like, oh, that's a good question. So um, you're basically giving, you know, you're giving somebody your initiative role. So I, I'd like, yeah, it's pretty powerful, but I don't see it being overpowered. Sure. I mean, it's only one. It's it says once for combat. I think it should be once per long rest. That's a good point because when else are you uh, rolling initiative? Right. Yeah. So like you know once per long rest, which like you know like depending on the the group, you you might only be doing one big combat every long rest. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I think making it once per long rest would probably be a good a good change to this. Yeah, I can see that being used uh, like cheesed out basically. Yeah. Like you know have somebody who has uh, really high initiative, mm -hmm. but you you know you keep switching it with like the barbarian, so he can charge in right yeah, away. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because uh, I mean like I've been looking at ways to like get really big uh initiative bonuses mm -hmm. um with one of, a couple of the character builds i've been looking at there's a version of ranger that gives you wisdom to your or is it wisdom i think it's wisdom to your initiative i think so like in addition to your decks or yeah in addition to your decks oh, that's really and then cool. i think there is a i think a swashbuckler gets your charisma to dex i think too i think so mm, i don't know all right and uh, not to dex to in initiative yeah so uh i don't know i just and then like there's the alert feat which gives you plus five sure sure so i feel like there would be a way to get a pretty high initiative mm -hmm. and if you were like the leader type and like just always got a high initiative you can like basically guarantee that somebody in your group anybody you want could be is gonna go first so yeah if somebody's in a dangerous position in the beginning of combat it's mm -hmm. like well i'm gonna roll really high my initiative i know because i've made my character that way sure and then i'm always gonna give him you know i'm always gonna give the person in the most danger the highest initiative or if nobody's in immediate danger let the wizard go first and then they can and shoot a fireball and not yeah exactly hit any of the allies so like i feel like that could be that could be cheesed out really easily yeah but having it once per long rest, yeah. even if they cheese it out, they can only do it once a day. Yeah, yeah, you know? I, I think that would that's a good way to do it. Yeah, no, I, I just I, I think this is a really yeah. cool item. I, it's I think it it serves a purpose that I don't really think any other magic items do. Right, and I like it. And if you don't, if you're not the kind of person that likes this sort of of uh, character or th this this sort of play style, I guess mm -hmm. it at least gives you a way to compartmentalize that. You can be like. You're only allowed to do this because you have this item. If you don't have the item, you can't, you know, sure. be telling everybody what to do and so on. And yeah, so on. yeah. But uh, yeah. Anyway, 
don't really think there's much else to talk about that. I know. I think it's really cool. Yeah, for sure. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, so that'll do it for the Dragon's Horde. If anybody wanted to submit magic items for the Dragon's Horde or questions for us to discuss or stories for the funeral pyre, mm-hmm. Jeff, how would they get those to us? They could send us an email at interpartyconflict at gmail.com. There you go. So before we go any further, we have a giveaway to give away today. Mm -hmm. As always, we're giving away a copy of Chapel on the Cliffs, which is a great adventure from Goblinstone. Goblinstone is a uh, group of content creators based in the UK, I believe. They're a great, uh, great group of people and they make some some great adventures. And one of which, of course, is Chapel on the Cliffs. So, Jeff, who is our Chapel on the Cliffs winner today? Our winner this week is Lord Grape Juice. Whoa, 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 winner. Gobble, gobble, gobble. Yes, congratulations, Lord Grape Juice. You should be getting that in your email within the next uh, few days, Mm -hmm. hopefully. If you don't get it within a week, I would say, let us know. Um, What what color grape juice we talking like is it like oh. the like the is it like the deep purple stuff i do like the deep purple stuff the deep purple stuff OJ, like, the, like purple the, stuff it's got that sort of tang to it you know <laughs> sure it's got a little bite to it yep um yeah so so congratulations lord grape juice um if anybody else wanted to enter this drawing jeff mm-hmm. how would they do so they could send us an email at interpartyconflict at gmail.com but in the subject line put chapel on the cliffs yes that's correct uh, and so I want to tell everybody that uh, our show is brought to you by our wonderful patrons. Yeah. We have a uh, uh, campaign at patreon.com slash interpartyconflict. If you like the show and you want to, you know, help keep things going Mm -hmm. and possibly get some bonus content for it, you can head over there. We've got some cool stuff on there. We've got fantasy fiction that I write every month. We've got uh bonus episodes like a a monthly bonus podcast for our five dollars and up patrons right we've got a monthly roll 20 game which is going to be going on a couple days in it's a couple days after we record this so by the time this episode goes out it will be over but but we're playing through the uh paul blart mall cop 2 rpg (laughs) Uh again so it's going to be a lot of fun (laughs) so yeah there's a lot of cool rewards on there um if you want to head over to patreon.com slash interparty conflict check it out See if anything appeals to you. If you want to help out the show and get some cool stuff, mm-hmm. you know, go check yeah. that out. And if you don't got any money to spare, just spread the word. Let let people know about us. You know, yeah. Let, let your let your group know. Yeah, leave us a review on iTunes if you want to brave the horrible <laughs> uh, program that is iTunes. Sure. Uh, or just yeah, just tell a friend. You know, all that cool stuff. It helps out the show. Yeah. So yeah, and hey, thank you for listening. Regardless. Yeah. And I also want to tell everybody to go check out the other shows on the Crit Nation Fellowship. We've got Crit Academy. Justin, Ian, and Brandon make uh, new and reusable content for players and DMs alike. They also wrote a book with some of their uh, player tips and DM tips and character concepts and encounter concepts and all that. They made that a few months ago. I helped write it. It's on DMs Guild. You can also find it by going to CritAcademy.com. Go check them out. They're a great show. Uh they're awesome. And then also check out D&D Character Lab. Garen and Dan make characters every week and pit them against each other. We were on their show in October. I think it was, it was either on Halloween or right before yeah. Halloween, I think. Right, yeah, yeah, it was the Halloween one. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, also Brute Force and Ignorance is a an actual play podcast on the network as well. So go check them out. They're great. Go check out all those. Yeah. So yeah. Enough of that. You want to go ahead and jump into some questions, Jeff? Sure. Our first question comes from Tim through email, and they ask, how do you feel about table talk during combat? Yes. And Tim was the one who submitted the commander's horn that we talked about earlier. Yeah. And along with it, he submitted this question. So for anybody who's not familiar, table talk is you're playing D&D or some other tabletop game. Your characters are in combat. You're going through turn by turn. And let's say... Jeff's character is about to go and attack one of the goblins, and then I'm another player, and I say, well, hang on, Jeff. Don't attack the goblin. Maybe attack this guy instead. Right. And then the two of us talk about that, and then somebody else chimes in, and they say, well, you know, hey, I've got this spell prepared, and I've got this spell prepared. And we're talking about all of this mechanical stuff, this tactical stuff, all this stuff that is not happening in-game. We're talking about it during combat. Right. Um... Do you have any any initial thoughts? Uh, yes, right. So it's it's sort of the idea of it's it's a it's kind of a way of metagaming in a way. It very it very much is metagaming. Yeah. It's you know it's it's knowing everybody's characters' thoughts. Sure, you know sim- it's simultaneously. You know, so it's like knowing what everybody's going to do ahead of time, mm-hmm. 
Whereas like the characters would have no way of doing of knowing that it's like, it's like right the character doesn't know that there's a thing around the corner because you know only the rogue has gone around the corner so far sure. so like in this moment I can't like immediately cast something because I know there's something you know like the rogue has to let me know that there's something around the corner then I can prepare a spell and do something about it yeah know? so. Uh, metagaming is a big part of it, mm. and we've, you know, we've said in the past, and I'll say it again, metagaming isn't inherently bad. I actually, uh, I'm, I'm for table talk to, to an sure, extent. Sure, I think that the difficulty of the game shouldn't come from the players fighting against the mechanics or the rules. Mm-hmm. The difficulty should come from the challenge that is before them. Right. So if so, the, like so, like taking the time to discuss tactics to solve the puzzle that is combat. Sure, sure. is part of the game. You know, if their roles aren't good enough, hey, nothing you can do about that. That's right. that's how the game is. Yeah. But if the party could have had more fun if they were allowed to talk about what they were hoping to do, mm-hmm. I'm I'm for that. I have I have no problem with that. Yeah, I can understand that it goes against people's idea of like this is a like it's a story and the story kind of happens yeah. and like it kind of gets rid of some of the random events. Like if like if you're so careful about every single thing you do, sure. You already know what's going to happen minus the dice rolls. Yeah. But like if if I don't know that the fighter's going to run in as I'm preparing to shoot a fireball, mm-hmm. like I'm going to have to change my plan on the fly because like I'm here, I'm winding up fireball, but it's not my turn yet. It's the fighter's turn. The fighter yeah. runs in, attacks. I'm like, well, now I can't use my fireball. So now I have to think of something else on the, like quickly. Sure. Sure. And you know, that could be frustrating, but that can also be like kind of fun and challenging. Like, oh shoot. All right. Well, uh, I got this other thing I can use instead. Yeah. Or like use my turn to say, dang it. You know, like, <laughs> you know, like, dang it. I was going to use a fireball. You dummy. And then maybe next time he'll know not to do that. Yeah. But, you know, it wasn't it wasn't something we planned ahead of t- like ahead of time. Yeah. A lot of people feel like uh, table talk and such is not realistic. Sure. I'm going to yeah. actually add in retroactively air quotes here. <laughs> quote, unquote, realistic. Because sure. I'll just say uh, nothing about turn based combat is realistic. Right. right yeah. But whatever. I, I understand the sentiment of it not being realistic because mm. you might. Have knowledge that your character doesn't have. So, like you were saying, if there is a uh, another enemy around the corner that one character knows and another character doesn't, mm-hmm. it you know some people would say that it is wrong to act on that. Um, another thing is maybe the wizard was about to cast fireball. The fighter might not know the wizard was about to cast fireball, so yeah. the fighter might think it's more real. The fighter's player might think it's more realistic to have the. His character just run in and attack instead of hang back and and wait for the fireball. Mm-hmm. On on to one extent, yeah, I would say that that might be realistic. You could you could see that you could portray that as being unrealistic. But similarly, as we we talked about a while ago, like ganging up in combat or like focus firing in combat, right? Yeah. Yes, we have knowledge the characters don't have because we are looking at the whole battlefield. And so on. But also, to an extent, the characters have knowledge we don't have. For example, we didn't play out the 10-hour journey from town to here. So maybe during that time, the characters were talking about, well, whenever there's a group of enemies, I'm going to shoot a fireball. Sure. And then the fighter might commit that to memory and say, oh, you know, okay, I probably shouldn't run in and and mess that up. Now, you can say that. I'm not saying you have to. But Mm -hmm. the point I'm trying to make is that it's only unrealistic if you don't try to find a way to make it realistic. Sure. Yeah, because I can see, I can see that sort of that sort of happening where, like, yeah, you're not going to play out every like you know every step of the travel between you know the starting town and the first dungeon or whatever. Yeah. Um. So yeah, you could say like, oh, you know, during our we we stop and rested for a while, and mm-hmm. and like I, I discussed the way that I do battle with with my companion here. Sure. So that they know ahead of time. Okay. If there's more than two enemies in a group, when we when we initiate combat, I'm throwing a fireball. It's gonna happen. Yeah. Um, but I could also see the DM saying like, "No, that didn't happen. You didn't say that, so you don't know that." You know, they're being stubborn in the like. It's like you didn't say that you prepared that spell, so you don't have that spell. Yeah. You know that sort of thing. And I mean, there none none of these is inherently right or wrong. Right. Um, I personally, my, my attitude with just about everything in life is like, 
as long as you don't try to screw me over or take it, ad- let me put this a different way. If you don't try to take advantage of me, I'm not going to micromanage what you do. Mm. If you are honestly just, hey, I know I didn't say I was going to do this, but I, I, th- I think it makes sense for me to have done this. Right. Okay, cool. Don't do that every time. Sure. D- don't make me feel like you are, you know, trying to take a mile when I'm giving you an inch. And I'm not going to, if, if you don't do that to me, then I'm not going to be like, no, you have to say every single thing that you did. Right. Yeah. You know? Like, yeah. Don't, don't try to take a mulligan on every turn. Exactly. You know, and, and we'll let you have one every once in a while. Like, it's like, yeah, it, make, it makes sense that the wizard who plays with fire with his presentation all the time. Yeah. yeah. He, like, I, I'm going to, I'm going to guess he's probably going to do something fiery and, and dangerous. So let's fiery and ballsy, fiery and ballsy. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I'll, I'll let him take the lead, you know, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, another important thing to remember here is just that different players get enjoyment out of different things. Yeah. I love tactical combat. Yeah. It's fun. That's what I, I really learned when playing fourth edition and then revisiting fourth edition after fifth edition came out. Like I really, really like the nitty gritty of the the tactics. And so, yes, to you, it might be more fun to only do what your character, you know, explicitly knows in the moment. Sure, there's an enjoyment to be gotten from that. But my enjoyment comes from we have these resources, we have these abilities. Mm-hmm. Let's find the best way to solve this puzzle. Like, sure. like you were saying, let's yeah. treat the encounter like a puzzle. Yeah. And, and go at it that way. Yeah, and I see this... Um, with less experienced groups, mm-hmm. th- things like figuring out like the very specifics of combat or like trying to like solve puzzles and stuff like that, and ba- basically ends up in a lot of table talk. Sure, and a lot of table talk can kind of s- like slow down. The- oh yeah, that's that's something. Yeah, that's yeah. a good point. Yeah, so like there'll there'll be a moment where like there's like there's a like it's it's you know it's not even always a hard complicated puzzle or combat or situation or something mm-hmm. like that. It's just like Three different people with three different ideas trying to, con- you know, convince each other, no, like, let's try it this way. Yeah. Or like, no, but if we do it that way, this will happen, that sort of thing. So, like, that can take a lot of time to where, like, one encounter or one room of a dungeon could take an hour and, like, you yeah. know, your, D- your DM's got, you know, eight rooms prepared for tonight, <laughs> but you're only going to get th- through two and a half. Sure, sure. The, you know, the, the, the last one, you just – you're. You were you were trying to discuss who should open the door, if you should open the door, how you should open the door. Wait, are you using mage hand? No, I have mage hand. Well, I can use it too. Well, I have tools. Uh, tools. So why don't I do it? You know what? No, I'm gonna. Why don't we take tie a rope to the to the handle? <laughs> you know, like it's like no, yes, yes. When 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 I am just like open the door, like or or like did anybody listen to the door? There might be no one behind it. Yeah, there might like. The idea of taking an hour discussing how to open a door when there's nothing behind it, I imagine the DM is <laughs> screaming yes. inside their head. Yeah, yeah, I've you been know. there. Yeah, um, yeah, no, that's a great point that uh, cannot be be uh, ignored. Right. Um, yeah. So I, I guess I'm for table talk as long as it doesn't bring the game to a halt. Right. As long as the players are getting somewhere, I'm yeah. all for it. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. If, if, if it helps a decision be made, sure. The, I'm, I'm for table talk, but if it, if it's like, if it ends up just being people discussing very specific things that aren't even mechanics in the game, they're just trying to like trying to, yeah, trying to tie a knot in, in a specific way so that when you pull it one way, it tightens when you pull it. It's like, oh, sure. I sure. Don't, I don't know anything about knots guys. Just open the door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um I guess to to add to something I was I was saying earlier, I you know how it's so frustrating when you're watching like a sitcom or a rom-com yeah. or something else with com in it where <laughs> you're like this whole thing would be solved if the players just or if the the characters <laughs> just <laughs> spoke to one another. Yes. Yes. Similarly, anytime I feel like this whole encounter would have gone so much easier if the players just coordinated what they were doing. Yeah. Uh, I can definitely get behind that. Like, mm. it, it is it is frustrating when the obstacle isn't the situation, but rather the obstacle is these artificial barriers you've put between yeah. the, the players. Yeah, it's always in the movie or whatever where, like, somebody didn't tell somebody something be- for whatever reason. Yeah. And had they just said it, like, you're like... 
if Harry Potter knew blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I don't want to spoil things. I don't know who <laughs> hasn't watched Harry Potter, read Harry Potter. Yeah. It's like, if you just knew this fact about your life. If he just knew that Voldemort was his brother. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, I, I'm just trying to say that, like, I, I'm not inherently against table talk because it's just, it makes the game move, mm-hmm. you know? And so I would, if you, if your difficulty, if this encounter is only difficult, if the players are unable to communicate with one another, you know, maybe it's not the greatest encounter. Yeah. Maybe that's what you're going for. Right. If that's what you're going for, fine. Yeah. I could, I could All see. All power to you. Yeah. Like you, like you step in a room and everything's silent and you can't, sure. you can't communicate. There, there but was. you can use hand signals and stuff. You know? Sure. I mean, yeah. If that is your intent, communicate that to the players yeah. and then, hey, yeah, go, go wild. Do whatever you want. There was a challenge of champions right encounter in one of the dragon dungeon magazines a long long time ago where it was was, was like gibbering mouther or whatever yeah yeah there was one of those down below the player they were up on like platforms and they had to get from one side to another by coordinating abilities but they couldn't talk yeah the the idea was like during this puzzle the players are not able to communicate they're not able to speak to one another and that was the point of the challenge mm. if it's the point of the challenge Fine, go for it. Awesome. No complaint from me, but just in general, you know, I'm 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 all for players having all of the information to make whatever decision they want. I don't ever want their their lack of understanding to be the reason that they failed. Right. You know. So just in general, I'm for table talk as long as it doesn't slow down the game too much. Right. Um Holy Blade 777 from Discord asks how do I get a player to vary up their tactics in combat? And this, uh, there's a little bit of context on this one. This question was presented in that there's a player in this group. I think I remember this one. That pretty much just like uses one attack and then go runs and hides, I think. Yeah. Like doesn't really ever try anything different. Uh, just like does one thing and then. I think it's. Uh, no, that's it. I think it was flaming sphere. Yeah, because fa- flaming sphere, you can you cast it and you create this sphere, and then as a bonus action, you can move it around. Sure, and it deals damage just by being next to enemies. Right. So the idea is they would, they would like start off. They would basically cast the spell, mm-hmm. run away, and hide, and then move the sphere around while also like shooting a uh, firebolt, you sure, know, from sure. a distance. You know, they would they would always they would always put themselves at a distance that they would basically never you know very rarely ever take damage. Yeah. Because they've, you know, created this thing that's just going to be there for them. And then mm-hmm. they go run and hide. And they, it was a tactic that they used every single combat. Yeah. That resulted that like that, that resulted in them just basically never ever taking damage. Sure. And so I can understand wanting the player to vary up their tactics as, you know, whether you're the, the DM, whether you're one of the players. That can probably get kind of boring. Especially if you're the DM and you're like... Well, I mean, no matter what I do, the player never seems to be in any danger. Right. And that I suppose that can get kind of frustrating. There were times when, I think it was when Zave was playing with us, he was playing a warlock, and every combat he would just be super duper far away shooting yeah. everybody with, with Eldritch Blast. Well, yeah, he had uh, he had Spell Sniper, you know? Yeah. So, like, Eldritch Blast, Spell Sniper can, you know, it's like freaking thousands of feet away. And, I mean, there's there are things I could have done to specifically combat that, but I didn't want to... I if I, I didn't want him to take damage because I made an enemy that could deal damage to him. I wanted him to take damage because I wanted, you know, just to present a balanced encounter and for all the players to be engaged. Yeah. But, I mean... Kind of like what I said with the previous question, different players get enjoyment from different things. Yeah. And the first, before you you answer how to get the player to change up their tactics, you really got to ask, why do you want the player to change up their tactics? Sure. If they're having fun, and if it's not making anybody else have less fun, I mean, maybe it is considering, I'm guessing it's Holy Blade 777 is the DM asking this question. As long as it's not bothering anybody else. I mean, if they're having a blast doing that same thing every time, yeah, I guess let them do it. Yeah, and the, on the discussion on Discord, like Jay kind of was just like, "Why don't you just talk to the guy?" Like, yeah, and that's you know, and that's that's definitely a good thing to <laughs> that's, do. That's the easy answer that's, for mo- most questions, right? Yeah. yeah, that's the that's the answer that it's like, yeah, you yeah, you should just just talk to him yeah. and and see like, is this what you want to be doing? Sure. Okay, then fine. Like that's that's cool. Um, but. Yeah, trying to trying to get trying to get somebody to try something new 
in a D&D game when they're uncomfortable with it, it yeah. you know, it could be it could be tough. You don't want you don't want to force something on somebody. I feel like anytime I'm told that I have to do something, even if it was something I was already planning on doing, I don't want to do it. Yeah, I don't want to do that anymore. I if, remember if, if you're going to tell me to do it. <laughs> right. I remember when I was when I was in high school, between my sophomore and junior year, I had the chance to go with with Jay, our friend Jason, who uh, who you just mentioned was part of this discussion on Discord. Um, we were in the video program at our high school and we went to, we took some college classes in Chicago. Mm. Um, and there was a point we were, it, we were like living in a dorm kind of for a few weeks and it was a lot of fun, you know, took some classes, met some friends, whatever. But there was, there was a day where they told us, Hey, everybody in this program, we all are going, we all have to go on this field trip, basically. Mm. Like, I don't remember where it was we went, but it was, we're all going to go to like this museum or maybe it was like the Sears Tower or something. I can't remember where it was we were going to be going, but everybody was like, or they just told us, everybody has to go do this. And if somebody had came to me and said, hey, we're going to go to this museum or the Sears Tower or whatever, you want to come? I probably would have been like, yeah, that sounds like cool. That sounds like fun. I'll I'll go along with that. Yeah. But because a person in authority was telling me, you have to go do this, drop what you're doing, we're about to leave. I immediately was like, I do not want to. I'm not going to do this. Yeah. I'm going to do whatever I can to not do this. Right. Because it, it's like at that point, it's not fun because it's mandatory and yeah. you're not in like, you're not in charge of what you're doing. Like. Because, you know, in that situation, the second you are – the second you go with it, there's going to be more and more things that you have to do. Yeah. It's like, okay, we have to be here at this time. We have to go to this place. We have to go see this thing. You know, like, we like we have to spend three hours waiting for this. You know, like, mm-hmm. it's – like, no, no, no. Like, if it was like, hey, we're all going to go hang out at the Sears Tower, you know, like – we're going to leave at this time and leave at this time, but anything mm-hmm. in between is up to you. You know, do you want to, you want to, you want in on that and be like, all right, cool. That sounds good. Yeah. But it, you know, if, if it's, if it's already a structured thing you have to do, it sure. doesn't sound at, at all entertaining. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I, I don't know if, I don't think necessarily that that's what's happening here, but yeah. just if you do talk to the player and you find out that, you know, they're doing that because they're having, they're just, they love doing it. They yeah. love the idea of having a character that creates a ball of fire and then hides. And then the fire ball of fire just like wreaks havoc on everything. Yeah. That's, that's really cool. Mm-hmm. Now, if it is taking away enjoyment from other players or from the DM, you know, okay. I think that's, that is a legitimate reason to want to change it, but try not to, to phrase it as, Hey, you need to do something else. Right. Be like, Hey. Um, have you thought, have you tried doing this? Yeah. You know, try to, try to come up with other cool combos that will feel just as awesome. Yeah. Instead of just saying, do something else. Don't do that thing you enjoy doing. One of the things I suggested in the discord was, um, like giving them, giving them magical items or something that would like give them new abilities that they might want to use. Okay. Or, uh, ways to augment the things that they do use. So he uses flaming sphere all the time. Mm Mm-hmm. Give them a magic item that, like, makes it so Flaming Sphere does more damage, but you have to be close to it. Oh, I like that. Or something. Like, you have to be you have to be within a certain range of it. Yeah. Which I actually think you have to be within a certain range to move it. Uh, I, might, I mean, it's, yeah, it's probably got a, a range limit, but. Maybe, uh, maybe I, I might have read that, uh, read the spell description, and I'm not sure if they, I think you have to cast it within, like, 60 feet or something like mm-hmm. that. But once you're. I think you could still move it even if you leave, like if you're like a hundred feet away from it or something. Yeah. But in any case, like you know, may- maybe there's a thing that's like if you're within five feet of the fl- flaming sphere, like you don't take damage, but it's everybody, else, but other people take more damage or something like that. Because I mean, you're I, like, I like that. Because you're like, you're 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 connected to it and feeding more fire into it or yeah. something like that. So, like, give him reasons, like the thing that he likes to do, give him a reason to use it in a different way. Sure. To his benefit. Yeah. I actually do really like that because. We I complained about the spell uh, healing spirit or spirit of spirit of healing or whatever. That's the one that where you walk through. You, you just heal. walk through and you take you gain all your hit points back. Um, <laughs> it, I think that that kind of spell is really cool if it has to be used in combat because if if it is something that the caster has to be right there and engaged in, and there's a chance that the player the enemies might be able to take advantage of it as well. Uh huh. I like that. It makes it so much more interesting and engaging of a combat option. Mm. If 
the if the caster had incentive to be within 10 feet of the flaming sphere, that's really cool because then the enemies have the option to attack the caster, but if the trade-off is a ton more damage, right, yeah. it's a real appealing option. Yeah. You but know. but it gets, you know, it gets that caster in the combat and not hiding behind a rock or something. Yeah. So like yeah, little little incentives to change things up. You know, but it's you know it's benef- it's it's beneficial to the player to mm-hmm. like you know it's a risk reward, but have the reward be something, you know, that the player is interested in, like yeah. you know making the one spell that they use make it more powerful, but at that risk. Sure. So talk to them, I guess. You know, to answer the question, try talking to them. Yeah. Try offering them. Ways to to change how things work to make them more appealing in some ways, but also more engaging in other ways. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, really, at the end of the day, I think that you know my my suggestion is just let the player do what they enjoy yeah. and just try to account for it. Yeah. You know, maybe have enemies that are resistant to fire or or whatever. Yeah, as long as long as the other players aren't like getting upset that like, well, he never takes damage. I always take damage. This is unfair. Yep. Like, unless that's happening, like it's not it's not necessarily bad. Uh, that a player isn't that a character isn't play, taking damage. Like it's not it's not like your m- combat encounters are being ineffective. Sure. Because if you if you're if you're able to take out a pl- a character that hurts the party as a whole. That's true. So like so Zave is always off in the back sniping, yeah. right? Yeah. But like if everyone else drops to the ground and yeah. he's way over there, like that's the end. Like he's just gone. <laughs> he's I'm like I'm out of here. Like there's right. not there's not much he can do from that distance to help the rest of the party. Like it's going to take them time to get over there to cast, uh, you know, uh, what, what is or it? Pour a potion down their or throat it, or something. Exactly. Like, like, you know, you can't, if you're the only one left and you're the sniper, yeah, you just leave, you got to leave. So like, that's <laughs> right. That's basically like, you know, that's in a way you're defeating that character in that way by making them the only one left and sure. they're off hiding somewhere. There's you're, you're, they're done. They're basically and, done. And really like I had to realize my goal isn't to defeat Zave. Right. It's just, I felt like, I don't know. I guess part of me felt like he or the other players aren't having as much fun because he isn't in danger. But mm. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't, I, I, I don't tr- know for a fact that was the case. I mean, if that's what Zave was doing, I trust that that was fun for him. <laughs> right, because right. That 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 guy knows what he wants, and he goes for it. Yeah, <laughs> he wants he wants a he wants a uh, he wants to start a uh, criminal organization based on mayonnaise. He stole the guard's key so that he could get himself arrested and then just so walk ridiculous. out of the jail. Oh, jeez. Um, and then that's playing the game right. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. And then uh, we had we had an encounter with like the big bad of the first story arc and. I, I I easily brought him down to like single digit hit points, and I was like, okay, I feel good. I, I don't <laughs> I don't feel like like right. Zave is in any way a problem anymore. Yeah. So so yeah. Um, try to figure out why you want to why you want the player to change up their tactics, and then mm. a- approach it that way. I guess. Sure. Uh, our next question comes from Jordan. Jordan. <laughs> There's a little H on the end there. Yeah. Suppose it's Jordan. <clears throat> this was on Discord. Do you think you should be able to ready actions outside of combat? Yeah, so this is a, this is a rules-based question. Uh-huh. And I'm not really going to have a ton of response to this other than the fact that I think that uh, the designers of the game are stupid. <laughs> so I guess let me explain. The ready action Dang. is it's an action in 5th edition D&D. I mean, it was an action in other editions of D&D too, but we're talking about 5th edition here. It is an action where you say... I'm going to spend my action now. I'm going to give a specific condition or set of conditions or whatever. And then you you say that to the dungeon master. And then if those conditions are met between now and your next turn, then the action that you said you wanted to happen happens. So you could say, for example, I want to ready my action to attack the first person that comes within melee range of me. Yeah. Maybe you'd want to be more specific and say the first enemy that comes in melee range of you or whatever. Right, yeah. You yeah. can always choose not to take a ready to action. But, That's true. But then in that case, you know, if you're you're waiting for some enemy that might be coming around the corner, an enemy comes around the corner, sees you, runs up to attack, you get to attack them first. Yeah. I I believe you're I think your ready to action goes off before the trigger. I could be wrong. Well, before the, it would have to go in, off after the trigger. Well, in third edition, it explicitly happened before the trigger. Huh. In fourth edition, there were immediate reactions and immediate interrupts. 
Yeah, the and then sorry. one happened before, one happened after. Right. I guess I should have looked this up. I don't recall whether it happens before or after, but mm. uh, for purposes of like, because like if let's say you kill that enemy in one hit, did they get their action off? Right. Well, I guess you say when they attack versus when they hit. I, know, I, I like, suppose. So I suppose. like it was like when they attack, I. I react by also attacking, yeah. and I think that would be, like, an interrupt versus, like, if they hit this person, then I attack them. Yeah. I don't know. I'd have to look up the ready rules, and I don't want to right now. Right. But <laughs> uh, there are some weird little things about readying that you might not be aware of. For example, if a spellcaster says, I'm going to ready a fireball spell for whenever three enemies are within, I don't know, 20 feet of each other. Sure. You could say that. However, in 5th edition, this is different than in previous editions, in 5th edition, if that doesn't happen, if there is no point during that round where enemies are close enough to meet those criteria, your spell doesn't go off, but you still wasted the spell. Hmm. Like, you you lose the spell slot. Oh. Because the idea is that you start casting the spell now, and then when your ready to action goes off, that's when you finish casting the spell. And since you've already started casting the spell... You waste the spell. Yeah. Which uh, I think is dumb. Yeah. Whatever. That's. I mean, that's not what we're here to talk about today. Sure. Just a word of advice. Assuming your DM is a stickler or is not particularly loose about this rule, don't ready. Don't ready. Spells. Don't ready a spell that is not a cantrip. Sure. Because then you'll you'll waste. You might, a slot. Yeah. You might lose it. Anyway, but Jordan asked <laughs> on the Discord. Do you think you should be able to ready actions outside of combat? Now, I thought to myself, well, of course, why wouldn't you be able to ready actions out of, outside of combat? Because right. my my assumption is that unlike 4th edition, because 4th edition was a very, very combat focused, very, very gamey for better and for worse. And 4th edition had a very clear distinction between you are in combat versus you are out of combat. Right. And I distinctly remember... One of the developers of 5th edition specifically saying 5th edition does not make that distinction. There isn't you. You can't have something that only functions in combat. For example, healing spirit or whatever. Yeah. Uh, would be great if it only functioned in combat, but you can't say it only functions in combat because how do you how do you say it only functions in combat? Right. Yeah. It's like when 5th edition doesn't really make that distinction. So I can only cast spells when I'm in danger, you know, like. Right. Yeah. Like, like, how do you how do you word it so that it makes sense that you can only do this while in combat? Well, apparently, Jeremy Crawford, one of the one of this, you know, the, the developers, the one of the people that gives answers for sage advice, which is not canon in every case, but it right. is like. If there is a way you can find out the intent of the rules, that's the best way to do it. Sure. You know, if you're going to make an, a ruling based on the intent of the rules, the best way to do so is to find the answer from either Jeremy Crawford or Mike Mirrells. Jeremy Crawford said, the options including ready in the actions and combat section, player's handbook, uh, page 192 to 193, are meant to be used in combat after rolling initiative. And then there was there was some other caveat. I don't see it in the thing that was linked to me, but there was some other caveat that like you can use. So spells are listed in the right. combat section, but you can use spells elsewhere because in the spell section, it's the general rules for spells say that you can use spells whenever. So, yeah. So unless so, it's as specified, otherwise things in the combat section can only be used in combat. Right. Is what he's saying. I think that's really stupid. Mm -hmm. I'll get to, to the actual, the, the matter at hand in a second, but I just feel like at that point, you then have to cross-reference everything mentioned in the ready in the combat section to yeah. find out is this referenced elsewhere? Yeah. If so, I can use it outside of combat. If not, I can only use it in combat. And then you have to you, you basically have to read over the entire book multiple times just to know what actions in this one section of the book are usable mm. or are applicable in more situations. Yeah. I just I just think it's if you're gonna write a book. Of rules. That is a very poor way to write a book of rules. Yeah. The the Warhammer rule books yeah. are awful at this. Like yeah. they they will mention a thing once at the beginning of the book, and then like chapters later, they'll mention it again and it like it, it is basically like, you know, it, it kind of um contradicts. Like it's like, mm -hmm. you know, 
it's really hard to like go through the the index and stuff like that to like in D in the D and D books. Like I, yeah. I fight with the index all the yeah, time. Yeah, the index is it's it's rough. I hate it. It's like why couldn't you just tell me where the page is? Yeah. Instead of telling me to go see this other thing. <laughs> see this other thing exactly. Like in the same amount of text, you could have just put the number. Just put the number. <laughs> like, yeah. So um, so according to this, you cannot use the ready action outside combat. Now I can understand. I can understand why this would be a, a touchy issue because I guess people argue about this all over the place. Sure. Um, and I'm definitely understanding that because I am, I have strong opinions that go contrary <laughs> to one of the developers of the game. But so a, a reason why you might not want to let someone mm. uh, ready outside combat is because if you're exploring a dungeon and you know that there's bad guys, a player could just say, yeah, um, I'm just always readying an attack first time I see an enemy. Yeah. And then. No way to surprise them because the moment an enemy comes in view, even if they haven't been able to, even if they lose initiative, well, he's got that action ready. So I guess his action gets off before the enemy. Mm. I can understand that. I would probably say that if that's what you're basing the difficulty of your dungeon off of, maybe that's not the, maybe it's not a very good dungeon. Sure, but, yeah. But also, I would have to ask, uh, imagine Jeff... If you said right now, I am never going to be taken surprised by anyone ever. I am always going to be looking over my shoulder <laughs> just in case someone is waiting to jump out at me. Sure. And let's say that you are true to your word and you stick to that. How long before you think you will be a nervous wreck, <laughs> exhausted because you can't sleep? Right. Or even on a smaller scale, just like. How are you going to carry on a conversation with someone while every few seconds you're like scanning around you to make sure that someone isn't right. about to jump out at you? Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned that because the alert feed is basically that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, in very rare situations, are you ever caught on surprise with sure. the alert feed? So it's like, if you take the alert feed, are you just a nervous wreck at that point? <laughs> like, I mean, maybe. I just think that if you don't want players to be able to do this thing that is within their power to do so, a person can... Be constantly looking around for for threats. There are paranoid people in the world yeah. who do exactly that. Yeah. It's exhausting. Yeah. There are reasons that people don't do this. For me, I like it's I mean, this isn't exactly the same thing, but like if I'm mad at someone, I can't stay mad at someone for very long. Like after a while, it's too exhausting for me. Sure. And I'm gonna give up. Same thing with if I'm in a tense situation and I'm looking around. Eventually, the the mental tax of having to be on high alert the entire time to the point where my weapon is in hand, ready to attack for more than like two or three rounds. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to start making some checks for something. I'm going to have to make <laughs> some, maybe a concentration check. I know concentration is a thing that you think of for spellcasters, but yeah, why couldn't it apply to a fighter that said for the entire dungeon, he's going to be writing an action to attack? Yeah. Maybe start having a make, make, start taking fatigue because he cannot let himself rest even for a moment. And for the last, I don't know, 20 minutes, he's been gripping his weapon yeah. and keeping his legs in a ready stance to jump out and attack someone. Yeah. It's exhausting. It's that's, this is another example where like, we're looking at it from outside of the character. So it's easy for us to say, oh yeah, sure. I'll just, I'll just ready in action against anything. But if you put yourself in the character's shoes, that doesn't seem that that solves its own problem. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah, I like. I, I do kind of see that as like you were using real, like realism, like like trying to like be realistic about it and stuff like that, yeah. which can be complicated. I, mean, I, I agree. Yeah. I agree. But you know, you, you you make a very good point, and even even just mechanically, if you think about it, yeah, readying an action takes an action. Yeah. Uh. An action which you can using, you know, like, it, so if you're out of combat, but you think of things in actions, mm -hmm. you're making a move action to walk around. Yeah. And if you're just walking around, you're probably using your action to walk around. Good point. So, like, sure. you know, like if you're just walking down a hallway, you're probably taking the dash action or something like that. To, to like yeah. Move. I mean, if I mean, because you're probably not taking a leisurely stroll down this dungeon. Right. So if you're taking an action to ready an action, mm -hmm. you're technic you're in some way moving at half speed in a way sure or um 
so like so it could be like okay you guys are taking you know extra time to get through this dungeon Mm -hmm. giving the enemy more time to prepare themselves you know um i really only see people doing outside combat ready actions when it's like okay we're about to open this door yeah and so i'm gonna ready an action to when the door opens i'll i'll fire at the first thing i see sure you know that you know, and I like I don't see anything really wrong with that. Yeah, I see nothing wrong with that you're either. Preparing for combat, you know, it's yeah. not it's not like, you know, it's not like gr- gritting your teeth and looking around at all moments. But in in that case of like, so like you're an archer mm-hmm. holding a bu- how about like dr- having a arrow drawn, yeah, for more than a few seconds is exhausting and it hurts. It hurts. Like, yeah, like you're like that is that is some dang like. You know, you got to have them crazy muscles to do that. And what's, what are the odds that you might accidentally fire and hit somebody? Right. So like you're, you know, if you're just, you got your bow taut the whole time, you know, that's going to take some toll on you. Yeah. Or if you're in like everyday situations Mm -hmm. uh, or like if you're like outside of like a dungeon, but you still want to be on high alert. Yeah. What are the other, what are the NPCs going to think about you? Like you always got your, you always have your weapons drawn all the time. (laughs) Yeah. No one's gonna go on to go near you or talk to you. They might even try to arrest you. Like, yeah. what? Put your put your bow away, sir. <laughs> you know, like you know, like what do you keep looking over your shoulder for? You are freaking me out. Like, yeah. you know, if if they're gonna do that, make it be like consequences. Sure, sure. You know, like role playing consequences as well as like mechanical. Like, oh, the okay, you're gonna take a level of exhaustion if you keep doing this. Yeah, yeah. I, I said earlier. Uh, well, I mean, I mean, you know, I was, I was talking about there should be all these like. All these ramifications for being constantly on alert. I don't, I don't like that. Mm. I don't think you should do this. Like you were saying, yeah, that's, that's making it, it's getting a lot more into quote unquote realism. realism like yeah. I, I, I fully acknowledge that. I'm not saying this is a good idea, but it's like what I was saying earlier. If you don't try to take advantage of me, I'm not going to micromanage you. Right. If you are trying to game the system by saying, I can never surprise you in any way whatsoever, just because you just say, oh, my character yeah. is always running action. If you try to do that, okay, fine. I'm going to do the equivalent on my end and have there be consequences for that. Yeah. I don't think there should be any issue with writing outside of combat because I don't think you're going to be writing. I don't think you should be writing an action unless there is a reasonable expectation of something about to happen. Yeah. If you are about to open a door, I see no reason why you shouldn't be able to fire at the first thing that you see. Yeah. But according to... Jeremy Crawford, you can't do that because combat hasn't started yet. I think it's all about the trigger. I think it's all about, like, how you define what the trigger is. You cannot be too vague. Sure. Or, like, you know, I think, like, having it be super specific isn't going to be beneficial for the player making the, you know, holding the action. But if you're being too vague, like, I am just always going to be looking over my shoulder at anybody coming at me. uh, Like, it's like, that's not readying an action that's being a paranoid freak. You know, like. Sorry to use that word, but like it's, you know, like it's it's different. So like the DM should make the call of like that's not readying an action. Yeah, like you can't do that. You could say if I see like I can you know if you see this one specific person or if you see a person of this type or if you see somebody you considered an enemy, mm-hmm. you know, like you could you can make a reaction or something. I, yeah. I don't know. I guess just uh, players don't try to game the system. Trust your DMs, DMs, trust your players, and if they try to game the system, then game it right back, mm. you know. So, I don't I don't think there should be any issue with writing outside of combat. I can see the rules, and I can see the intent behind the rules. I don't agree with it. So, you know, use your best judgment. Yeah. But, but the way I see it, I, I don't think that that rule, I don't think that needs to be that way. I think you can... As long as you trust your players and as long as the players trust the DM, I don't think there's any issue. Sure. So. Yep. All right. Well, that'll do it for our uh, regular questions for today. Uh, but we do have our social media discussion questions. So last week's social media discussion question was, has D&D ever influenced your dreams? Mm. And I believe I said I had a dream where I met the queen and we played D&D together. Right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and I don't think you had. Yeah, nothing I could remember specifically, but mm. I do. I do like the the queen <laughs> one because like, like I said last time, I was like, I feel like it's like it's just barely believable yeah. because like the queen's a nice enough person that in that awkward situation, she'd be like, oh, what is that? You know, sure, sure. 
Uh, so we got it. We only got a few responses on Facebook. Justin from Crit Academy says, I now have a and d podcast. So, yes, <laughs> there you go. Oh, goodness. There yeah. Go. Yeah. Uh, Sean says, aspirationally, I brought an Ender 3 3D printer sleeping, dreaming about things happening at a table that didn't happen. LOL. So basically saying like uh, aspirationally D&D influenced his goals. Oh, sure. And then sleeping wise, uh, dreaming about things that happened at a table that didn't happen. So, gotcha. Uh, Brandon B says, sleep's a crutch. Who has time for that? Mm. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, on Reddit, Javakler says, absolutely. I once had dreams of working in a career where I made a ton of money and had all kinds of disposable income. Now those are trash because I throw every dollar at D and D. Oh wait, you were talking about something different. Ha ha ha. Oh dear. <laughs> so yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, Stiltskin Koopo 84 says, I don't know that I've had a dream entirely made of D and D material, but I have been in a Minecraft dream where a skeleton spawned and shot me off a tall ledge. When oh. I respond, I, I continued playing as Diva Steve. <laughs> I, Diva Steve? I don't know who Diva Steve is, but... Well, I, well, Steve is the character from Minecraft. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I've, I've, I've had a, uh, I've had Minecraft dreams before, for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Because like, there, were, there were times when I was playing that a lot. Sure, sure. You start seeing things in like a grid. You know, yeah, like there's a... there's a thing called the Tetris effect mm. and that is when you do an activity coined by Tetris. People would, you know, watch blocks fall down and fit together and everything. You do an activity so much that you start seeing it. You start like looking at the wall and then picturing, okay, like a block could fit there. Another one could fit there. Right, yeah. This is going to be real weird and nerdy, but for the majority of my life, I've had that with Sonic. Sonic and Knuckles specifically. Mm. I will like, I'll look at a, a doorway and I'll think, okay, yeah, Knuckles could fly over and climb up that and then jump over the other thing. Yeah. I, I never even owned that game. Huh. So I don't know why that has been the thing that has stuck with me for sure. almost my entire life, but that's always been my thing. Huh. Anyway, anyway. Uh, over on Discord, Debrasaur says, I think fantasy in general has influenced my dreams. So, okay, that's... Mm. That's fair. And the beverage T says, just last night, I dreamed I was at a former boss's house and he and his family turned into zombies. Oh, no. I wondered if I had turn undead and then I was coloring on their carport. I would like to think I was doing a ritual, but more than likely, I was just going off on a dream tangent. Right. Yeah. So. Which is, yeah, that's basically how dreams work. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And then uh, on Twitter, Collins B says, you know, those kinds of dreams that somehow make you wake up more tired. Happens literally every time I DM. Oh, no. So, so there you go. <laughs> so, yeah, dreams being influenced in many different ways. Yes. Uh, and then the social media discussion question for this coming week is, what is your favorite third-party gaming supplement? Mm. So, like, what what book not made by Wizards of the Coast? Right. Or, I mean, I guess it doesn't have to be d and I mean, sure. I, I don't know enough about other systems to know what breadth of third-party yeah. Uh, stuff there is, but just a book for a gaming system that was not made by the official makers of that gaming system, but it's still really good. Adds something to the game that you wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, with the with the DMs Guild and stuff like that. Oh, people, so much stuff on yeah, DMs people Guild. People are able to publish stuff now, you know, yeah. left and right. So it's like, you know, homebrew stuff is becoming third party stuff. In yeah, a way. absolutely. Um, the stuff that I can, the, the things that I remember are like the quintessential books by mongoose those were really good those were really good uh i remember like i think i i think i had i think wow, did i have it or i don't know i like the, i had access to the quintessential ranger ones like one yep. and two and that was a lot of fun because i like the i like the ranger stuff um so those were really cool i don't i can't there was one that steve had that he let me borrow for a while mm-hmm. was it was um i think it was also mongoose but it was on uh uh focuses like magical focuses okay. like it's, yeah. it was material components and 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 foci yeah. uh back when in third edition material components and focuses functioned a little differently than they yeah. did in fifth edition and like there were some cool things where it's like if you're casting um bull strength yeah it uses you have to use the hair of a bull mm-hmm. if you were using the hair of a minotaur instead Ooh. you would get like this extra bonus or something like yeah. you would have the bonus to uh, the strength and then you get like a bonus to like bull rushing or something like that yeah yeah you know, that's, give, that's really cool it would give you like a little added bonus if you went out of your way to find a, a rarer but similar material mm-hmm. 
Um, so like that was kind of that was pretty neat. Yeah. Um, in third edition, I would say my favorite third party supplement was probably there was a a book all about monks. It's called mm. Beyond Monks: The Way of the Fight. I think yeah. that was what it was called, and it had a ton of of uh, prestige classes. It had a ton of like magic items, fees. It even had like epic options all kind of revolving around monks and they were really really cool mm. there was a, a class that jay took for his character ardric that what it was the entire basis for his character it was you started as a monk and then you started like training your skin to be as tough as possible to the point sure. where someone could attack you and break their weapon on your skin <laughs> and like it's such a it was just such a cool theme for the class yeah such a cool whatever and also it it had, there was a build that I made. I made a Goliath monk that could, oh gosh. without rolling, oh gosh. jump straight up 100 feet. <laughs> because of how <laughs> jumping worked in third edition. Yeah, yeah. Because of how there was this ability you could, like, spend one of your stunning fist attempts to give yourself a bonus to your jump, jump skill or yeah, something. because it was the jump skill. It's based on, like, the skill roll that you make. Yeah. So, basically, I would, uh. like, whatever I rolled, I had, like, a plus... 160 or something you just and then all your key points just something like whoosh. that yeah and so so because of how how jump worked and how goliaths worked you didn't need a running start so he could just just straight up just oh, 100 feet straight gosh. up it's is pretty cool um in fifth edition though i do want to say the um <laughs> monstrous races book on uh, it's on dm's guild by tyler camstra i think is that the one who took the entire the monster entire manual the entire monster yeah. manual and made them all into playable races yeah I, yeah i read through that so thing. cool yeah i so read cool. that i read through that and there's some like there are some that it's like like oh that's so, sort of whatever you yeah. know like it's just like okay that's a simple way to to put it but like there are a few where you got real cr- real creative and yeah. like that was really neat like it like it's like i could play a mimic you know <laughs> yeah. Or, but like it was the way he was able to take you know something like a mimic or a um, Medusa or whatever. Sure, and it's sure. like well, yeah. How do you deal with the petrifying gaze thing? It's like well, okay, it's a thing that like happens over time or something like that. You're gonna use it once per long rest. Yeah, and like he broke it down into points. Yeah, yeah. So like each one is in theory balanced because the ones that had more powerful abilities got less other stuff. Yeah, and so on. And it's like, and he even gave suggestions like if you wanted to give it a little bit more power, mm-hmm. do this. If you want, or or in a powerful case, he's like, if you wanted to give it a little less power, you know, give it this instead. You know, yeah. So it's very very cool. Crit Academy just did an episode about that a few weeks ago. Mm. Um, a while back, D and D Character Lab did an episode where they made characters from that. I think one of them was a. A shambling mound paladin. <laughs> like I just, I love that. I love that that concept. So uh, I think that's a really really good book. But there is a ton to choose from on on yeah. DM's Guild. That'll do it for our questions today. Um, but before we close out, I think uh, let's wind down mm-hmm. a little bit. Let's uh, let's let's relax. Let's take a deep breath <sighs> as we toss another log onto the funeral pyre. All right, our funeral pyre story for today comes from Deborah Sor via the Discord. Mm. And if you're not on the Discord, come join us. Yes. It's very fun. It's a lot of good discussion on there. Yeah. So come check that out. Mm. You can find the link on Facebook or Reddit or just contact us. So uh, Deborah Sor says, so my group is playing through the Out of the Abyss adventure mm. and was in the middle of accidentally crashing the Demon Queen of Rot's overly turned up bachelorette party. <laughs> Basically, if Hellraiser threw a rave. Oh, gosh. When their NPC friend, Sarath, was overcome with insanity from the fungal queen's spores. Mm. Instead of letting him suffer or risk him betraying them, a previous friend of theirs turned out to be a serial killer who used a few party members to make gore effigies. Oh, my. They created a mosh pit as they danced through the rave of nightmares, throwing Sarath in. Oh, gosh. I'd explain his death in more detail, but I'm afraid the censorship police might show up. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Something's got a little... All right. Yeah. (laughs) There was a lot to unpack in that. But uh, (laughs) anyway, I guess let's raise a glass to well, well, was it Sarath? Yeah, I guess it was Sarath that died. Right. Or was it Sathorn? <clears throat> Sorry, go on. So let's raise a glass in memory of Sarath, who shouldn't have <laughs> clink. clink.
Well, that'll do it for today. To submit questions for us to discuss, items for the Dragon Sword, or stories for the Funeral Pyre, please email us at interpartyconflict at gmail.com. For show notes, links to media mentioned on the show, and running lists of questions and magic items, go to interpartyconflict.com. Join the discussion on social media. Find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash interpartyconflict, on Reddit at r slash interpartyconflict, on our interparty Discord, or on Twitter at inpartyconflict for our weekly social media questions. Your answers might end up on the show. Find us on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, YouTube, anywhere you download podcasts. Please rate, review, subscribe, or just tell a friend. If you'd like to support the show, check out the rewards at patreon.com slash interpartyconflict. There's a few different tiers, so anything you can spare, even a dollar a month, would go towards making the show better, and you'll get bonus content for it. Jeff, tell us about FriendQuest. FriendQuest is our YouTube channel where we play video games, and you can also watch a stream on twitch.tv slash friendqueststream. Yes. And a uh, question for you. Do you think that by this time, by the time this episode goes out, will you have beaten Sekiro? I don't. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't know. It's, um, I, it's hard to say where, like, where I am at yeah. in, the, in, the, in the full yeah, story. I mean, it feels like I'm close to the end. Because I'm, I'm almost as far as you are. Yeah. It feels like I'm close to the end of the game, but I don't know. I have no idea. Like, some weird stuff happens, man. Yeah. So, uh, speaking of video games, check out my side project, the Arcade Memories Podcast. If you'd like to submit your own childhood memories of going to the arcade, record them or write them to me at arcadememoriespodcast at gmail.com. Also, head over to bit.ly slash interpartyconflict to take a short survey about our show, what you like, what you don't like, etc. And just for taking it, you'll get two free printable board games, courtesy of Mary and Tom over at hollandspiel.com. And our music is made by Boxcat Games from Nameless the Hackers RPG. So, Jeff, until next time... No, Gabe, I was going to cast Fireball. Oh, all right. Go ahead. All right.